Okay, we checked all four systems, and there you go on modulation, all four, and key with a go. Roger, you're allowed to clear here, also. Discovery's four computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. The second stage tanks now pressurizing, and we're coming up on the power transfer. Our stage is pressurized at this time. Ten, nine. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on. Five, four, three, two. All engines running. We have liftoff. Quiet. Good morning. <laughs> Are you all ready for a space travel today? That's very good. I got my last te text message from my colleagues at 3.12, so I assume some had their space travel last night already, but <laughs> there will be another one coming, and we will have tremendous speakers today, so it will be a great morning, and uh, you will see some good speakers, good messages, interesting stuff. So really, really very much look forward to it. But first of all, I want to start thanking again our sponsors. And first of all, of course, our premium sponsors, uh, Cisco, uh, Fujitsu, and Intel. Uh, I called it out on Monday already. We do tremendous stuff with these guys. And what I'm particularly proud of is, is that these partnerships developed over the last few years. So we do business with these guys for over 10 years, with Fujitsu almost 20 years. And we always evolved on the demands of the customers and uh, do really, really great things around IoT, around cloud with them. So very proud to have them. And also very, very big thank you to all the other sponsors uh, that we had here. I hope you visited most of them. Uh, they all have very, very good stories uh, to tell and a really close collaboration. I want to call out one, which is Weem. Um, I want to call out Weem because uh, they just announced a very, very close integration into our platform into our on-tap platform and a complete integration into our solid fire platform. So I think this is of big value for all of you. But big thank you to all the sponsors because very, very clearly, thank you. Very clearly, this event could not take place uh, without them. And um, I thank them for the sponsorship and the partnership, obviously. So we talked about Rise Against Hunger and you see the target was 7,000 tweets, and we are over 10,000 tweets already. I almost got the feeling Donald Trump is in the audience. We are permanently tweeting. So that's, that's really fantastic. And um, as I said, I think everybody here in this room is very, very privileged. It is a fantastic thing to be here. We can focus on, on the good stuff. Uh, and. Um, I think it is important for me as a person, for us as a company, and I'm sure for you as an audience, to give back some of that. So thank you very much for contributing, and don't even think about stop tweeting. Good. Some interesting numbers. Um, a lot of things are going on, and I hear positive uh, things from overall, but uh, maybe interesting for you what was going on in detail. Uh, we had 289 sessions so far which I think is an amazing number. Um, just to give you some insight, the top three most attended hands-on labs. So you see very, very much around ONTAP, very much around integration into our partners' platforms. You also see the most attended breakouts, um, which are also very much around ONTAP, but obviously also Flash uh, seems to play a very big role for you. So you see there's a lot of things going on, and uh, I could not be more proud and want to thank everybody who put a lot of effort to put good content together for all these breakouts and sessions. A big thank you for them. And as a result, and I think this is also historically always a big part of Insight, besides it's a good show and it's good networking and it's good fun, 
We have 535 certified users leaving Berlin so far this week, and I think this is a very good thing, and I thank you very much for all that effort. Thank you. Good. You heard us talking on Monday very much about um, how the world is changing with data. And uh, Kenneth Kuki, I think, did a very, very impressive uh, speech uh, showing good examples of how the world is changing with data and how precious and how important data is for you as a company. And almost every chat that I had with, with customers and partners individually was really around how the world of data is evolving, how important data becomes for your company. So this was more or less the whole Monday, and I think it was very, very exciting. Uh, yesterday, we talked about how you can change the world with data and uh, how to become a data visionaire. And I think this is key for you as a company and for you as a person in this company you are working for to really lean into this kind of challenge around data. And um, to be honest, I'm 18 years in the company, and it was yesterday um, uh, in the main session uh, seeing all these demos, and I was excited and, and, and really proud to see what is possible. It is almost unbelievable. Do not know how you feel about the demos yesterday. I think they were great. And what, what also keeps in my mind is really the, um, the Thriver Survivor panel that we heard. And um, yeah, to be a Thriver, I think it is very much leaning bold into into everything around data. And uh, if you see the study that we've made together with IDC, we asked 800 companies uh, globally um, to give us a statement how they feel about data, how they handle data. Then the reality today is that just 11% of these companies see themselves as a thriver. Um, over 80%, almost 90% of the customers of you guys um, do not see themselves as somebody who really leans into the data and really tries to make the most out of it and the best out of it. And if I may give you one call to action and maybe one thing that you can change when you leave Berlin is, the, is your view on data, is really how you can help your own company and your own organization, either it's a customer or a partner, to really go the next step as a company. Because I'm 100% sure your company will need it and I'm 100% sure that in 10 years from now, brands that we all loved and that existed since we are little kids will be vanished and gone because they did not lean into that challenge. And other brands, other companies that might not even exist today will play a big role in 10 years from now. And I think it's up to you. It's very much up to you guys. It's in your hands what your company will do with that. So if I may say this one call to action, lean into that one. It is a key one for you and your company. Good. So this was my first intro and before I go to the other speakers. Uh, I have the big, big pleasure uh, um, to be the host of a, a panel, and it is a service provider panel that I'm hosting right now. Um, the service providers are key for us. They've always been. We do over a billion of revenue with service providers. It was always a stronghold. And service providers always need to lean into architectures, into innovation very, very early, because their whole business model relies on that. And therefore, I think it's quite interesting to have a panel uh, that really helps us understand what drives service providers today. And for that reason, I want to welcome on stage three of our most important service providers in EMEA. And I want to call out on stage from eins and eins, one and one, Alexander Fierschroth. <laughs> from Darts, Mr. Lars Goebel. And from All for One Steep, Michael Scherf. Hi, Alexander. <laughs> Hi. Please take a seat. It's great to have you all here. Thank you very much for taking the time and uh, uh, being with on the on the panel on us. Um, yesterday we, we we saw exciting demos. I, I just shared my excitement again. It is fantastic uh, of what we've seen uh, around the interaction with the cloud. And still, the question is always. Um, how real is the hybrid cloud? Everybody talks about, talks about multi-cloud and fantastic scenarios, but how, really, how real is that really? And you are closely interacting with customers on a daily basis. Michael, what is your view? What are you seeing? Yeah, we see that the, uh, the cloud is in, ev is in everybody's mind by, by our customers, and uh, we see more and more hybrid cloud projects realized uh, 
by uh, services like success vectors or cloud for customers from S SAP or uh, simple managed service services uh, which are provided by us. So we see it coming also in the German markets. It's coming, okay. That's very, very good. Alexander, what is your view? Yeah, I completely share that. In the end, the German SMBs, especially the German SMBs, or as we call them, Mittelstand, is very cautious about the cloud currently. So nobody with a sane mind will push all his data and all his workload into the cloud. So they will definitely stick with their on-prem data center and just move the workloads one by one to the cloud. So we definitely need an offering in mm. that area. That is very good to hear that, that the hybrid cloud is involving. Before we move on with further questions and go a little bit more deep, I want to give you the opportunity to really give um, the whole audience, because we have a very international audience, uh, a, a quick idea who your company is in detail and what the focus is. So maybe starting with you, Alexander, if you may. Yeah, sure. Uh, one and one is one of the top three web hosters in the world, depending on the KPI. We're number one, uh, number two or number three. And we also have, of course, uh, cloud hosting offering, so infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Yes. Yeah, Darts is a digital evolution provider acting uh, as a new generation of uh, full IT service provider. So we provide, uh, based on our hybrid cloud platform, the uh, possibility for multi-cloud sourcing from co-location housing over private cloud uh, hosting up to hyperscalers like Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure. We bring them together and consolidate one solution for our customers. Exciting, thank you. Yeah, Alpha well, Wunsch Dave is the number one SAP partner in the mid-markets. Uh, we focus on the German-speaking markets, uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Um, what we do for our customers, we implement SAP projects. We deliver them with service and support, with application management and managed services, uh, which we produce in our data centers. Um, we also build up a strong uh, practice in the Microsoft issues, like Office 365, SharePoint, and uh, Azure, Azure as, a, as a cloud for using, uh, to use it as a, as a data center for us. And uh, to the line of business, we go with subsidiaries we have. We, we sell also success vectors, Concur, cloud for customer, hybrid solutions, and sell this to the line of business uh, to our customers via subsidiaries. That's exciting. Thank you very much for that introduction. And it's good to have a three service provider here who really cover a very diverse, I would say, requirement of, of, of our customers' base. Uh, we talked about hybrid cloud from the start because I was simply curious on if that is real. Lars, uh, what use cases do you see moving into the cloud uh, today? So hybrid cloud is uh, always a topic of scalability and flexibility. So business models, new business models based on data, um, where I need scalability because a huge amount of users, um, but also uh, use cases which have uh, data privacy uh, rules to fulfill. Um, or data privacy regulations, uh, data security points they want to respect in their company. Um, and this is always a point where only one hyperscaler um, is not good. Um, and also, if you talk over multi-cloud sourcing uh, for hybrid cloud environments, because you want to use the best out of every hyperscaler, um, this is definitely a use case for hybrid cloud. Hmm. Yeah, that's for sure the case. You, you, you touched on the data privacy issue and um, uh, I think uh, the basis of your business model is also net up private storage. Um, um, so how, how, is, how is your feeling around data privacy, especially in the EMEA market, Lars? What, what does, do customers think and what are the challenges? So with GDPR, data privacy um, is uh, going more and more important because uh, the companies uh, now know that they maybe have to spend a lot of money if they are not confirmed. And uh, this is the possibility for IT to get more awareness um, for uh, their situation at the directors of the company. And uh, we see that at the moment um, all companies uh, go through that point and uh, looking how they can realize their IT in a confirmed way. Mm, that's for sure the case. You mentioned GDPR, Michael, a very frank and open question. Are our customers GDPR ready? 
Uh, some are, some are not. So as always, so uh, it's it's not it's all not in the focus of the business because most customers we have the mid-market companies who do the business, and uh, they are not so uh, staffed that they can do all the regularities. So mm. not only data privacy and such things, so some more, and so it has to be part of the service to deliver this kind of stuff to the customer in a complete package. It has to be within the services. Yeah. Alexander, do you see GDPR being taken serious enough? Let's phrase it that way. Well, I think yes, nowadays. But um, in the last months, many customers approached us about mm. that topic. And nobody is really eager to talk about that topic because it's complex and very hard to handle. But in the end, I think it will benefit all of us because, as I just mentioned, the Mittelstand in Germany is very cautious about the cloud. So he has to have strict rules, and we have to show our customers that they have their data really secure in our data centers and they do not have to worry about that. Absolutely. So you're also acting as kind of a consultant uh, for, your, for your customers, if I get you right, in, in that direction, which I think is a very, very important thing because, I, as I stated several times, technology can do a lot of things, but I think we are often talking also about culture and processes. So very good to hear that you support our customers on that one. Um, Alexander and Michael, I know you are both uh, very close with Microsoft and, and SAP and also you, Lars. Um, I, wrote, I read an article that SAP and Microsoft uh, are both ranked as two of the top five cloud players in the world. Um, um, so, Michael, honestly, uh, with dealing with Microsoft and SAP, will they eat your lunch one day? Will they be a competitor more than a partner for you? What is your view? No, because we are sitting since years on the same table. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we lunch together because they are a partner and, and it's not a threat, it's a challenge and, and uh, opportunity for us. What our job in the last years was to, to take the solutions these big numbers have and to build up mid-market solutions out of them and to put our own IP into these ideas we have. And that will be the next year, will be the same, same business, the same deal. Um, the content will be a little bit different than the last year. Yeah, more in the cloud, less on, on premise, but it's the same table and the same market, so we are partners. Mm. You've seen us interacting closely with, with Microsoft. Alexander, what is your view? Well, I think there's enough lunch for everybody, <laughs> <laughs> and nobody who thinks about cloud will just focus on one cloud provider. In the end, Nobody who's making serious business can just go with the one cloud provider strategy. And so I think multi-cloud is the way to go for all the customers. But I do not see Microsoft as a real competition for one and one Because what our customers want is that they have somebody to deal with on the same level. And that's something that uh, the SMBs in Germany especially are missing with Microsoft and AWS and so on. I think that's why one and one and Darts also is really good in a really good position in the market. Mm. So you still see a strong position of local service providers in, Absolutely, the, in, yes. the, in the local market. And I don't think that that is going to change very soon. Yeah, I think so as well. And we, you heard me talking on Monday about uh, 80 countries participating here. So um, that's for sure a very important message. Um, Lars, you heard us talking on, on, on uh, yesterday, I think it was, uh, about our strong partnership with, with Microsoft uh, around Asia. Is that something that really matters in the end to our customers? What, what is your feeling? Definitely yes. So um, if we think about multi-cloud sourcing, and uh, I'm 100% uh, uh, as opinion that this is the future, uh, because I can combine um, the, the best things out of all worlds, I have to take care that I don't move data, if possible, via NetApp private storage as a service, um, or uh, I can have an efficient way to migrate data. Um, and this is uh, enabled by NetApp and NetApp Data Fabric. So I think that's very important for the customers. And if I look at the market, I still see that the CIOs and the technical guys search for the right way to realize their infrastructure to be ready for multi-cloud sourcing. Um, we are not in the position that everybody has realized multi-cloud uh, sourcing because for multi-cloud sourcing you need a hybrid cloud platform which enables you to use whatever you want um, directly in that moment. And um, 
it's possible today um, with NetApp and NetApp Data Fabric. We have realized it and we offer it to our customers and that's why we are so, uh, so happy that NetApp is uh, ongoing um, developing with other cloud providers at Microsoft. That was a perfect NetApp pitch, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot get enough of that, Michael, yeah. you... Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> My, Michael, you lean into uh, NetApp architecture very much as well. Um, yes. And uh, I think most of your, of, of your storage and data management solutions are based on NetApp. What does data fabric mean for you? Yeah, the key is data, um, because uh, when, when you tr tr do service transitions to provide services to customers, you have to move the data. And so we know since, since years, the key issue in our transition projects is to move the data from A to B. And when you nowadays look at the scenarios in, in the cloud world and the customer's world, you, are, you have two big points. One is the system of records, the classical data and the ERP system and so on. Uh, it's a typical managed services issue today. So uh, the data has to be in data centers. They have to be in, in the German data centers for, for some customers. And when you look at the, at the new kind of stuff, like uh, the systems of innovations like SASX Factors or Power BI or Leonardo from SAP, all these tools and services will grab to the data of the customer. So moving the data all the time is a real big issue. And if you use, want to use cloud agile, flexible, and quick, yeah, you have to have good infrastructure ideas to connect your classical systems with the cloud. And NetApp is, is the part who does it in, in our perspective very well for the data. That's very, very exciting. Thank you very much for that insight. Alexander, I think uh, our partnership comes from a little bit different background. I think you were kind of an acquired customer <laughs> through, the, through our SolidFire acquisition roughly two years ago. Yeah, you won't want to hear a NetApp pitch from me now. <laughs> <laughs> How did you experience everything? Well, we started with SolidFire around two and a half years ago, I think it was. And, well, we were looking for a really agile, disruptive storage provider at that time. And somebody who's focused on service providers, on hosting providers, and where we could influence the development to a certain degree, of course. Uh, so when SolidFire was acquired by NetApp, I kind of had mixed feelings about that because it would not have been the first acquisition that goes where the company goes down the drain in the end. But what I've seen from the acquisition so far and also heard from the SolidFire staff is that it works out perfectly, not only for the SolidFire products, but also for us as a service provider, because we can now benefit from the support structure from the worldwide sales engineers and tech engineers we have available at NetApp. So in the end, it went out quite well. That's good to hear, that's good to hear. And I think in your business model, also mobility and elasticity uh, plays a big yeah. role. Maybe you can touch on that one a bit. Definitely. For us, it's very important that the customers can move around within our product range from one product to the other without having to migrate their data or, of course, risking to lose their data. And that has to be perfectly seamless. So for us, it was important that we have the opportunity to move a customer from product one to product two and offer him a different quality of service without any interruption. And that was something that uh, the NetApp SolidFire solution did very well for us. That's very good to hear. Thank you very much for that. Um, Michael, um, I think uh, the, the roots of Alpha One Steep can come very much out of the SAP environment. Yeah. Um, and I would assume that we have roughly 80, 90% SAP customers here in the audience. That's good. Uh, so what is your view? What is the latest and greatest in the SAP world? What is going on with HANA? What what do you see as a big trend? Yeah, the different uh, perspectives on that, when you, when you look at the technological stack, uh, migrating to HANA means in, in, in the, the customer cases to, to ask the question, make a buy on a, on a different perspective. And we see a lot of buy decisions in this case. Uh, and when you look at the applicational side, um, the S4 HANA enterprise management suite leads to uh, typically to a cloud first strategy and that means all the stuff in the data center get under, under the lens and customers decide more and more to acquire services than to run their IT business by themselves to focus on the opportunities which lays in the application layer uh, which are delivered by SAP. So a total change of mind in, in classical, also in classical mid-market companies from less make to more buy, and that's good for us and other providers in the markets. 
That's very good. That's very good. Lars, um, just uh, out of curiosity, I think uh, two years ago uh, you had a platform here already as being our first NetApp private storage partner. Uh, yeah, correct. And, uh, two years ago it was. Um, so what, what is your view now? Did this offering pay off? Is it a good solution? Uh, do customers lean into that? So first of all, it was a pleasure two years ago and uh, today, uh, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, we realized out of NetApp Private Storage, NetApp Private Storage as a service for our customers. And uh, this is really the key product out of our portfolio. So our hybrid cloud platform is based on NetApp Private Storage as a service. And we were able to position that in a very good way at our customers. So we still see that the companies search for the right way how to realize their hybrid cloud, multi-cloud sourcing strategy uh, and we can fit in with this offering. Um, we can yeah, fix the infrastructure problem and offer a solution out of the box where they can switch between Amazon Web Services and Azure in seconds because they don't need to move data. Um, this was a great success story for us and we were able to win more and more customers and um, yeah, we will further focus on that topic um, and uh, yeah, help uh, hopefully a lot of companies to realize the digital transformation of their in IT. That sounds very good and that sounds very good and very, we are very proud to be your partner of choice still. So we have the the day um, calling out the future and, and what is going on in the future and as a Final question, uh, my question in your direction would be, how is the future looking like for your company? What are the focus points? And is there maybe a call to action you want to give to the audience? Michael, maybe starting with you. Yeah, it matters on, on who you ask. When you look at the analysts and the market uh, researchers, uh, there will be big, big, huge opportunities, mega billion dollar markets. Uh, what we see is we, what, what we realize is a, is a 10 percent, 50 percent growth, and uh, that's the plan for the next years in an organic way, um, because you have to handle all this kind of stuff and the growth. So there are big opportunities, interesting issues, interesting projects. Is what we see, and uh, it's a, it's a matter of change, and change is fun. It's a lot of new new stuff, and not always the same. Um, call to action, when, when you ask me what uh, should, should or can I say to everyone here, I assume there is a lot of engineering knowledge and competence in this room and it's the same in my organization. So the tip is go with the cloud, not against it, and design clever services and on that way you will get the customer's advisor and then you win in this change because it's an opportunity as well for every engineer. You know, we need them over the next couple of 20, 100, 200 years. Yeah, nothing without engineering. Very good, very, very insightful. Uh, last future for your company and the call to action to the audience? So we want uh, to further uh, help our customers to bring the CIO in the position to push the business again. So um, we had the situation when IT was coming up. Um, we are now in the situation that business is uh, pushing uh, IT. Um, and that's hard for the CIO and it's hard for the development of the company. And uh, we try uh, to help our customers and the companies out there to change that and bring the CIO back into the driver's seat um, and uh, help uh, to develop their company. Of course, out of that, uh, we wish uh, growth of our company and uh, call to action. I think it's much more important to give uh, the employees time to build up knowledge about Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and the other hyperscalers, and then um, think about the strategy, how to build up the environment. And after this work is done, we can really realize a hybrid cloud platform for multi-cloud sourcing. That's very good. Thank you very much. Alexander? Well, on the company side, if you look at the acquisition strategy of One and One and United Internet of the last year, we did not only acquire a mass market web hoster, one of the largest in Europe, uh, the Strato, but also an enterprise infrastructure as a service provider, the Profit Bricks from Berlin, which, yeah. which has quite a big footprint in Germany and the US. So from that, you can easily guess what we are trying to do. We will focus on the pro market and even on the smaller enterprises in the next year. 
On the product side, I think the container revolution is still going strong. So I guess Docker, Kubernetes, and all these development options are really going to grow in the next year. And they arrived in the mass market. So that's why we are focusing on that one as well. We are currently having out a closed beta for our next container offering. So everybody who wants to join, it's completely free. Feel free to join and participate in the development of that product. Oneandone.com slash cloud community. Just register. That is a very good call to action. Thank you very much for that one. <laughs> so thank you very much for your insights. It's good to see that you're all leaning into growth. I will immediately adjust the forecasts of my sales guys. And <laughs> but it's, it's absolutely great to see that you see growth in your companies. Um, I, you, you hear and read a lot of articles that say the hyperscalers uh, will wipe out all the service providers locally. I think we heard that this is far from reality and um, that you have a strong vision over the next few years. So thank you very much for your insights. Thanks for being here and thanks for that panel. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Good, thank you very much. Um, so I think we have, have and had a, a very, very impressive insight so far. And um, I think the question is always, will we do it again? So what is your feeling? Is Insider a valuable event? The only thing is, if we would do Insight again, I would need your promise that you will show up again next year. So would I have that promise from you? Yes. <laughs> that is very good. That is very good. Because we took the decision to do Insight again next year. I want to announce it now. And um, I want to announce the city. We've been four years in a row in Berlin. Um, but I always hear from my American French boss that it's cold and wet and rainy here. Um, so that I stop him complaining, we decided to go in a different location, which will be wonderful Barcelona. <laughs> Excelente. Um, I have to admit one thing, we decided on Barcelona, we did not finally decide on the country yet. <laughs> but this will be sorted out, pretty sure. Um, good. So I promised you a wonderful morning. I promised you good speakers. And um, the next one is an unbelievable speaker I want to introduce on stage. Um, I made that comment yesterday already. Um, there's ultimately two persons responsible that I'm here on stage today. The one is my father, and the second one is the founder of this company. And as you can imagine, I will not introduce you to my father now. Um, so I will introduce you to the founder of this company, the one and only unbelievable Mr. Dave Hitz. I am so proud of NetApp. When I think back to three years ago when we first announced our data fabric strategy, and basically what we said is our mission as a company is to help our customers move to the cloud. And I know a lot of people thought that was crazy. I know that because they told me. I remember talking with industry analysts, and they're like, wait a minute, the cloud's the thing that's going to kill you and you're gonna help your customers go there faster? Are you insane? And I just feel so good about how it's working out. Not everybody's gonna go 100% to the cloud. In fact, few people will. But people increasingly are wanting that to be part of their solution. And I think people are trusting that NetApp can help. They're, they're finally getting it. And if anything symbolizes that, I think our relationship with Microsoft does. Yes, to help people move traditional enterprise high quality infrastructure into the cloud, Microsoft said we would like to partner with NetApp to do that. So I feel like it, it is turning out well.
Now let me make a transition. I want to talk about crazy things. Does anybody remember when the Curiosity rover landed on Mars? Show of hands. For people who don't remember, that's the one that like comes down through space. There's a heat shield. The heat shield blows off, and then there's retro rockets, and the thing comes down, and then it gets 100 feet above, and it sets down a rope. Do you guys remember this? What, when I first saw the description of how retro rockets can come down, it's going to lower the rover to the surface of Mars, I said, that is <laughs> insane. That is never going to work. And here's the thing, you're only insane right up until you succeed. And I'm talking about NetApp as well as the Mars rover. You're only insane up until you succeed and then you're a visionary. And so with that, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Adam Seltzner, whose team landed the Curiosity rover on Mars. Come on out, Adam. Good morning, Berlin. Yep. This is Mars. A very beautiful image of Mars. This is actually a real digital elevation map constructed by hundreds of satellite overflights and the data rendered to give you the perspective of flying at about 40,000 feet, like you would in a jet. It's a very special place on Mars. It's called the Gale Crater. You can see the rim of the crater in the edge of this image, and rising out of the crater floor, the massive Mount Sharp, over 5,000 meters high. And down there in the shadows, between the proverbial rock of the crater rim and the foothills of Mount Sharp, there's a rover named Curiosity. And it is, was, my greatest professional honor to lead the team that put her there. Uh, it was um, a, a bit of an amazing feat. Uh, some people called it crazy. But the story of getting to Mars and making that landing happening, happen does not start on Mars. For me, my journey starts here. Uh, I was a poor student. This is the San Francisco Bay Area. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was a poor student in high school. After barely passing my high school, I played rock and roll. I was playing rock and roll, hoping to become the next Elvis Costello. And one night, returning home from playing a show, I noticed that the stars were in a different place in the night sky than they had been when I went out to to play the show. In fact, up in the upper left there, you see that constellation of Orion? It was that constellation, although I didn't know its name at the time. It had been in the east as I went out, and it was in the west as I came home, and I was mystified. I was amazed at the motion of the stars in the night sky. I had missed that whole Earth spinning on its axis thing in high school. I got curious, and I followed my curiosity down to my local college, uh, community college, College of Marin, to take an astronomy course to teach me why the stars were moving. It had a prerequisite of a physics course. I thought, physics, mm, I'm not so sure. And then I read the subscript. It said, physics for poets. Physics without math. All right. <laughs> that might work. So I signed up for the course. And thank heavens that I did. Because that instructor in that course took the spark of curiosity I had experienced when I looked up and saw the motion of the stars in the night sky 
and it turned it into a fire of exploration that has burned across my life and changed the course of my life and perhaps changed the way we land on Mars. If Adam of yesteryear were to know what Adam of today's job is, his head would have exploded. But thank God we never really know where our curiosity might take us. So that's kind of what I want to talk to you today about. Curiosity and exploration. You know, curiosity is the spark and exploration is the fire that burns from it. In some sense, my life represents two arcs, two parallel arcs of curiosity and exploration. First, my professional life, I actually helped land a rover named Curiosity on the surface of Mars to do our collective exploration. And the second arc being the personal one, the, the journey of exploration I began when I allowed myself to be moved by my curiosity and go take that class so many years ago. So let's talk about Mars. For eons, Mars has captivated our attention. From before we had aids to our vision, we looked up at the night sky and we saw a light a little brighter, a little redder than the other lights in the celestial sphere. When we first got aids to our vision, our first telescopes, we looked up and we saw life. We saw roadways, we saw canals, we saw civilization. And then we got better telescopes. And we recognized that those are just natural features on the surface of Mars. But we never lost that idea that maybe Mars was alive. And that's understandable. It's a profound thought. It's a profound question, you know. Are we alone? Are we alone in our universe? Are we alone in our solar system? Could one of our nearest neighbors harbor life? Well, NASA has been trying to answer that question for decades. First with the, in, in the 70s with the Viking missions, and then later with rovers. Now, if you want to get to the surface of Mars, you've got to do four things. We call it entry, descent, and landing, but it's really four pieces to the puzzle. You hit the atmosphere going approximately 10,000 miles an hour, 5.9 kilometers a second. For us, on landing night, we were going 13,327 miles an hour. That's fast. In fact, that's fast enough that the kinetic energy, the energy of motion, can melt or vaporize the entire spacecraft. That's considered totally uncool. So we <laughs> wrap the spacecraft in a shell, we coat that shell with a material that will smolder and won't burn, and we shed that energy to the sky on Mars, burning a hole in it as we slow down. That process slows us down to about 1,000 miles an hour, still not slow enough to land on the surface of Mars, so we need to open up a parachute. In our case, the world's largest supersonic parachute opened up at Mach 1.7, just shy of twice the speed of sound at Mars. A huge parachute, almost the width of this room when fully opened gives us a neck snapping 12 G's of deceleration. That slows us down to a couple hundred miles an hour, about 180 miles an hour or so. Still not slow enough to land on the surface of Mars, so eventually we have to let go of that parachute and go onto rockets. Now, every mission that's ever been successful that's made it to the surface of Mars has used these four pieces of the puzzle. But depending on how fancy your rockets are, whether they've got throttles or not, or how good your ability to sense the ground is, you end up with a little tiny bit of velocity left over. We call it error velocity. Yeah, you know, one, 10, 20 miles an hour, and then you need a system to cushion that final blow. Now for us, for Curiosity, our touchdown error was one and a half miles an hour. That is a brisk walk. The kinetic energy is one three millionth of one percent of the arrival kinetic energy, and yet the, the engineering of that touchdown system gave us some of the greatest challenges. 
Where we were landing was no easy feat either. This is another image of the Gale Crater. This is now shaded relief. Orange is high, blue is low. You can see the nice flat landing zone. And I've overlaid all the uncertainty ellipses of every successful mission to Mars. These are the 99th percentile hits. And you can see that as time has gone on, we've gotten better at finding where Mars is and getting more accurate. But to land on the safe blue flats, we are going to have to do a quantum better this mission. And when we got down there, we weren't landing just any old rover. Here is a, uh, here's a family portrait of the rovers we've put on Mars. You can see starting in 97 with a little Sojourner rover about the size of a microwave oven. Very important because we were able to put her down on the surface of Mars for less than one-tenth that which we had spent on the Viking missions in the 70s. In fact, we were so happy to be spending so little, only $350 million, that we said we would go back every single opportunity we could. They come every 26 months because of the way that Mars and the Earth move around the sun. Now you'll notice there's a little bit more than 26 months between 97 and 2004. It ends up being we were playing a little bit of a limbo game. We said that was great, you did a mission for $350 million, totally awesome. Can you do two missions for $350 million? No, you can't. In fact, you cannot, all you really can do for that much money is make a smoking hole on the surface of Mars. And you don't get a lot of credit for doing that, I can tell you that. But we rallied, and in 2004, we put twin rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, on the surface of Mars. And they were important because they taught us that liquid water had been on the surface. And we know from here on Earth that liquid water is present where there's life. But they couldn't tell us some important things about the water. Was it salty? Was it sweet? Had it been there for a long time? Was it acidic? Was it basic? In short, was that ancient wet Mars habitable for life? Well, in comes curiosity. 900 kilos, chock full of all the science instruments necessary to answer that question of habitability. But at 900 kilos, she is really hard to land. She's big compared to rovers. She's big compared to human objects. And it was that final piece of the puzzle, the touchdown system, that gave us the greatest challenge. We looked, we pulled out all the engineering stops. We started with airbags. That's how we had cushioned the final impact of the little Sojourner rover and the twins, Spirit and Opportunity. Unfortunately, at 900 kilos, there are no fibers known to humankind. No polyaramids, PBOs, Xylons, Technora, Vectran, you name it. There's nothing that we have strong enough to make a bag to handle the impact. So that was out. We tried looking at legged landers. We'd landed on the moon in Apollo with legged landers. We'd landed on, the, on Mars with Viking legged landers. Now, unfortunately, um, in that period of time between 97 and 2004, where we had those failures, one of those failures was a legged lander. And we refamiliarized ourselves with just how tippy legged landers can be in uneven terrain. And you put a 900 kilo rover on top, tippiness, extra tippiness. And in fact, uh, we decided that was just the, too unstable. So that was out. We tried to solve the stability problem by adding legs and spreading them out and letting the lander do a belly flop. It worked for stability. Now it ends up being that our propulsion system with the tanks are in the belly of the beast and our fuel, monomethylhydrazine, it's annoyingly toxic when we work with it here on Earth and naturally it's very explosive. And exploding on touchdown, also considered super uncool. So we armored up the belly to protect it against rock strike 
And by the time we were done with that, it was just too heavy to launch. So in the um, fall of 2003, we gathered everybody together who had anything to do with a successful Mars mission and try and figure out how to do that last piece of the puzzle. We knew we had three of the four elements, but we needed our touchdown system. We spent two days in a not very well air conditioned room at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and when we emerged, we had this idea. We called it direct placement, but very rapidly it took on the vernacular, the sky crane. And as Dave mentioned, we knew two things when we emerged from that room. One, sound engineering principles had led us to that solution. And two, every time we spoke of it, people would say we were crazy. In fact, I did a lot of the speaking, and I can remember starting to talk about it and just feeling my credibility drain into the floor. In fact, I got so tired of it, I came up with a pithy little statement I would make before I'd ever even begin to discuss the sky crane. Great works and great folly may be indistinguishable at the outset. Now, I love statements like this. This statement is both true and simultaneously meaningless. Those are the best statements, by the way. They sort of add credibility, but they don't really take you anywhere. Um, the, the truth of it is maybe obvious. If something's very different, something looks super strange, you will have no point of reference, no way to juxtapose it to that which you know, and it might appear crazy. The meaninglessness of that statement is, of course, that crazy also looks crazy. So just because you say this statement doesn't mean that the next words out of your mouth aren't completely whack. Although I promise you, actually, a little secret, that if you do make this statement, then no matter what comes out of your mouth, people are like, oh, hmm, okay, maybe. Now, unfortunately, the whole team labored under this statement. We had no way to test our landing system. We live on the third rock from the sun, not the fourth. We've got the wrong surface gravity, the wrong atmospheric composition, atmospheric density, the speed of sound, you name it. There's nothing we can do to test our landing system here on Earth that will prove to us that it will work on Mars. We do analysis, which of course we do, uh, pen and paper, computer simulation. Here is um, one of millions of computer simulations that we conducted before we ever tried to land on Mars. Here we're landing on a slope so steep and so slippery, the rover can barely rove. And yet we're able to land her safely. Results like this buoyed our confidence. But analysis in general, modeling certainly, and simulation, don't protect you against sins of omission, the I forgots. When I build a model of the universe in my computer in ones and zeros, if I omit an important law of physics, an important phenomena or behavior, the computer won't tell me that. It will just dutifully turn the crank on some weird, strange little universe I've created inside of its bowels and give me an answer that may or may not have anything to do with what we should rightly experience when it comes time to land on Mars. So after 10 years of investment and $2 billion spent, we had to gather the team together and essentially collectively hold our breaths and ask the question, had we done a great folly or perhaps a great work? Coming up on entry. Vehicle reports entry interface. At this time, it'll begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, it'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. Vehicle's just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. We have seen peak deceleration. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. 
Speed chill step has separated. We're on the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers in descending. Standing by for batch all separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single dice, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. That was a good night. You know, infinitely preferable to the alternative that could have awaited us if the work of over 3,170 some odd women and men at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and thousands others across 37 states in the US and seven nations around the globe didn't come together that night to make that outcome. Now, I know for myself, and I know for many of my team members, the ones and zeros that come down that tell you that the rover's done its job, they take the front of my brain to figure out. And they don't connect me as viscerally to our decade-long effort as these. These are the first images of a new place in our solar system brought to you by the blood, sweat, and tears of those women and men across the US and around the globe. They are from the right going left, the first image of Mount Sharp seen from the surface of Gale Crater. This has taken a couple of days after landing. We've removed the uh, dust covers that block and protect the lenses. We get a nice clear image. You can see Mount Sharp in the background, the rover's uh, shadow in the foreground, and in the mid, the beautiful black sand dunes that, that separate us from the foothills of Mount Sharp. In the center, the first color image of the surface of Gale Crater, this taken by an imager on our robotic arm. Also a few days after landing, we have not removed the clear dust cover that protected the lens, and the red iron oxide rich dust that gives Mars its red color gives this image a ghostly red hue. But my favorite image for the entire mission is the one in the far left. This is the very, very first image taken from the surface of Gale Crater. We had a, a satellite above us as we were landing. And that is the communication pathway through which all the telemetry, all the data you saw us reacting to in the control room was passing through that link. We were just about to lose that link. It had been timed perfectly just to cover our landing. And we thought we might have just enough time and just enough bandwidth for one image, and we chose that image. It's from the rear hazard cameras. These are fisheye lens cameras down low on the bottom of the rover. They're there to protect the rover when she's driving around. These are the ones on the rear. And we chose that camera and that image at that moment because we were kind of just hoping against hope we just might see that. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Whoa. What? You might have to trust me, but that is actually the impact plume of our descent stage, our jet backpack, hitting the surface of Mars after it's dropped us off. You know, we come in, we let go of the parachute, we, we go into rocket fire, we've got this propulsion system strapped to the back of the rover. And then about 22 meters above the surface of Mars, we release the rover below it, lower it down, both of the bodies descend until the weight of the rover is taken up by the surface of Mars. 
and then we cut the descent stage free and it flies off to a safe distance to the rear of the rover to land or impact the surface a safe distance away. That is the impact plume of that event. So we got everything. We got things we expected, really cross your fingers, like successful landing, and things we didn't even dream of, an action selfie of the landing. <laughs> On the numbers, it was a good night. The green, the red, and the black are variously where we thought the rover had landed, once we knew where it had touched the atmosphere, where the rover thought it had landed, and where it actually had landed. Separated by a few hundred meters, not good if you're playing a game of golf, but if your golf shot is 352 million miles, it's awesome. <laughs> so, So 30 days after landing, we took this beautiful mosaic, images underneath the bottom of the rover to make sure we hadn't landed her on a rock. If we'd landed on a rock, I probably wouldn't be here speaking to you. And then NASA patted the landing team on the back and said, go find work. After all, we were kind of the movers. We were just the guys getting the rover to the spot. All right, there's your rover, have a good time. And a whole new team of people, 400 strong, across those seven nations that I spoke of, came together to drive the rover and figure out where we wanted to take her. They made beautiful decisions, and within six months of our two-year mission, we had drilled holes into the bedrock of a place called the Yellowknife Bay and brought up a blue-gray powdery material, distributed it to science instruments inside the belly of the rover, and given the scientists back here on Earth, the data they needed to answer the question that Curiosity had been sent to ask. The question is, was ancient, wet Mars habitable for life? And the answer is yes. Three billion years ago, when life was just getting a toehold here on Earth, the conditions to support life were ripe on the surface of Mars. It's kind of profound. We don't know whether life started in both places at the same time. We actually know that during that period of the solar system's evolution, the two planets actually communicated with one another because of what's called the late early bombardment, in which we were being struck by asteroids and ejecta was flying both back and forth between the two planets. So life could have started here on Earth and been ejected to Mars could have started on both places simultaneously, or it could have started on Mars and been ejected to Earth, and we're all Martians. That's kind of a weird thought, but it's in the decision tree. So, data. You guys are data people. Let's talk about the incredible data that we bring down. Huge volumes. I mean, we do 100 to 500 megabits per s capital S which stands for Sol, which is a Martian day. Our maximum data rate is 500 megabits per day. It's like living, drinking through a cocktail straw. Our, um, our data rates range from, honestly, dial-up speeds to, at moments, when we're talking to satellites just above us, pretty good. We require 75 megabits of that 100 to 500 megabits per day just to figure out what we're doing with the rover the next day, just to get enough images, enough data from the rover to understand what to do with her next. And the entire data that we have received from Mars over the, over the, year of the years that the rover's been up there would fit quite easily on my outdated iPhone 6. So we are not big data. We have to be very, very choosy. We are super small data. We have to choose very carefully on the front end what data we try and pipe on to Earth. So here she is. Her name's Curiosity. She's doing our Curiosity's bidding on the surface of Mars. I love this image. It's a beautiful panorama. You see Mount Sharp. You see the spacecraft. But this image opens a question for me. 
why do we do this? Why do I do this? Why did I do this? Why did I spend 10 years of my life designing a rover, designing a landing system, to put a robot on Mars to root around in the dirt? Is that particularly practical? I mean, sometimes when I think about human behavior and practicality, I get a little confused, but some things I know are practical that us humans do. Like, like this is practical. Not the selfie, but that 737 behind me. I'm going to get on that aircraft, and I'm going to go from Burbank, California, to Houston, Texas, right outside the gates of the Johnson Space Center. It's a trip I do a few times a year. It takes me three hours and 15 minutes to make that trip. When my mother was my age, that trip probably would have taken about three days. When her mother was my age, it would have taken three weeks. Air travel has absolutely revolutionized the way we think about our society, the way we move goods and services, the way we do business. So many of us here today came here via air travel. But if you look at the early uh, exploration of flight, you don't see anything that portends to the great significance it will have upon society. Early exploration of flight looks a little silly. Early explorers scared horses. Evidently, if you wanted to explore the heavens, you had to be prepared to swim in the oceans. Early explorers were embarrassed, or should have been, and some of them should have been downright humiliated. I don't really know what this guy's thinking. <laughs> and unfortunately, all too frequently, early explorers paid with the greatest of possible costs. And yet, we kept at it. Despite the danger, despite the impracticality, we kept at it and eventually tamed the skies, even though for years, air travel would be a risky proposition. So we don't explore because it's practical. In fact, I argue we explore despite it being impractical. Do we explore for the laudable science question? For the wanting to know? Perhaps. This is an image of Times Square on landing night for us. It was a Sunday night on the west coast of the United States, east coast. It was Monday morning at 1.30 in the morning. Thousands of people crammed into Times Square to try and watch us land on the big jumbo screen they got there. Now, are they all crammed in there in the middle of the night because they're just dying to know about the pH and salinity of the ancient aqueous environment on Mars? Yeah, I don't think so. And not only that, I think it's more akin to when tens of thousands of people gather to try and see if an athlete can cross a set distance in a fraction of a second faster than another athlete. I think when we explore, we're asking questions about ourselves. As individuals, as a teams, as nations, as a people. We're searching for the edge of us. What can we do. I think Neil Armstrong understood that with the words he would say, choose to say when he'd first stepped foot on the moon. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. He was hinting to us that he was carrying us with him and that his, he became more by the juxtaposition of that tiny footprint against the vast backdrop of space, we all became a little bit more. When we explore, we're really asking questions of our humanity. Who are we? How grand are we? How great is our reach? What questions might we dare to ask and hope to be able to answer? Now, I've been thinking a lot about this, this exploration, our curiosity that drives it, mostly since landing. You know, I had a great job. I was engineering this thing. We were building this device. It worked. And then people kind of freaked out. I was in Barcelona at an airport. Somebody says, you are the Mars landing guy. I said, I'm not the Mars landing guy. I'm one of thousands of Mars landing people, but, uh, but thank you for that. 
I recognized that what we were doing, what we were representing, was our humanity. That our exploration was in some sense a gesture of our humanity, and that makes perfect sense. Because curiosity is in the depth of our genetic makeup. It's in our genes, born through hips too narrow to pass a fully baked human brain. All of us come into this world naked and incapable. In fact, that's our bag. We come in almost completely unprogrammed with very few lines of code. Perhaps the most important is be curious. And we all are. Every single one of us in this room, whether you identify as curious or not, you started to make your own model of the world, starting at time zero, driven only by your curiosity. I've got a one-year-old boy. I watch him pour sand and water onto his hands, into his diaper, and he is learning about the universe driven by his own innate curiosity. Before he could speak, he knew about mass, length, time, gravity, the difference between a solid and a liquid. We all did that. Now, an interesting thing happens. As we get older, we start relying on that model that we first built when we were at T0. And we don't necessarily recognize the world as it really is and bring our sort of native curiosity to bear upon it. If we do, our minds stay agile and we stay competitive and innovative. In fact, that curiosity and our exploration help drive and change our world. So what's next for NASA? Where will NASA's curiosity next take it? Well, the National Science Foundation, the National Research Council, the U.S. body of great thinkers has been telling us for a while that we should bring samples of Mars back to Earth. Because to really unlock the mysteries of Mars, you've got to bring Mars back to Earth. It's a hard job. It takes three separate projects, but NASA is stepping up, and the first of those projects is due to launch in the year 2020 and take samples for eventual return to Earth. And I'm the chief engineer of that project, thankfully. But Mars is not the only place to explore. Europa, the ice moon of Jupiter, a thin ice crust, a mile, five miles, 10 miles. We don't really know the thickness of the ice crust. We know it's thick enough to protect a liquid water ocean that we know is more than twice the volume of all the seas on Earth. Protected by that, that crust of ice, that liquid water ocean is a place to explore. Now, I'm no exobiologist, but I drink beer with exobiologists, and they tell me that their best bet for where life is existing today in our solar system is this icy moon of Jupiter. And I hope to help NASA put a lander on the surface of that ice and see what evidence of life has upwelled. So now this image is a beautiful image to me. It used to fill me with terror. It used to wake me up every night. It doesn't do that anymore. It makes me feel strangely both proud and humble. Proud to have been part of this great team and humbled to have been so lucky to be part of such a gesture of our collective humanity. But this image also opens up a question for me. Where will my curiosity next take me? You know, years ago when I followed my curiosity of the, about the motion of the stars or the apparent motion of the stars in the night sky, my life changed. And maybe I changed the world a little bit because of it. Since that time, I've learned that if I can keep my team members and myself in touch with our native curiosity, we, we create better solutions. We solve more profound problems. So it's a great question for each of us to ask, perhaps best asked and left 
unanswered, hanging in the air, wondering, where will your curiosity next take you? Thank you very much for your attention. tell you right now what I'm curious about. Why did I agree to take the speaking slot after the Mars lander guy? <laughs> I've got a question. Yeah. If Elon Musk offered you the flight to Mars, yeah. safe delivery guaranteed, yeah. but maybe coming home, maybe not. Yeah. That's how the early explorers did it. Would you go? So I have, as I mentioned, young children. Um, and a beautiful Is that the card. reason you would go? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I would think, wow, think of the sleep I could get on Mars. Uh, no, um, and a beautiful garden. And I personally, along with everybody in this room, evolved on this planet. So I'm kind of happy right here. I love the idea of exploring, um, both with robots and with humans, because it's part of what, it's part of our makeup. It's sort of the fundamental gesture of ourselves. Mm -hmm but I don't need to be the one living somewhere else. Do you think any human, while you're alive, will ever touch the Curiosity rover again? I certainly hope so. I will work hard to make that true. Because I have a question. If you send an object into the void and no one ever sees it or touches it again, does it exist? Interestingly, Dave, the data tells us that it does. <laughs> Dude, thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. When, oh my God, look, he wrote a book. You know, he talked for, Adam talked for a little while. Uh, about uh, the amazing stuff that's going on. But if you want the, the next step and, and the bigger, more detailed picture, you should uh, pick up the book. Unfortunately, we don't have any here. But, you know, internet, the cloud. <laughs> when I meet with customers these days, what I'm most curious about is, what are they doing with the cloud? How do they think about the cloud? And sometimes the customer, like the panel here, sometimes the customers are cloud service providers. And then the topic is about how does their cloud interact with other clouds? Because everybody's curious about the relationship of clouds and, and how do you deal with that? Um, it, it's an open-ended question. What are you doing with the cloud? And people answer so many different ways. Sometimes someone says, well, we're building a private cloud, and here's what we're doing. You know, that's, it, it's almost like a Rorschach test, you know, the ink blots. Uh, or someone else will say, well, we're starting to experiment with Amazon. But I'm just, I'm always curious how they're thinking about that. And I'd like to describe one conversation that I had with a customer that really helped shape my thinking of, of how to go about these chats. This was the, the vice president of infrastructure at a very large insurance company, very large insurance company. And I asked him, what are you doing with the cloud? And he said, well, Let's not start with the cloud. Let me just describe how I think of my infrastructural model overall. He said, I, I think of it in three categories. The first category is configured systems. You know, we design them up. Large systems, small systems, fiber channel, Ethernet, Unix, Linux, like we wire it all. Um, and it, it's not necessarily bare metal. It might be VMware, but this chunk of it is for Oracle. And maybe this part is for virtual uh, VDI, virtual desktop. You know, it's, it's kind of traditional, the stuff we build, like what, we, what I've been doing in my life. That's the first category. The second category is private cloud. And it's very uniform. You know, 1U servers racked and stacked, very simplified design, software uh, def defined infrastructure. So that's the second model, the private cloud. And then, of course, the public cloud, Azure, Amazon. Uh, Google, IBM Cloud. And so 
we went to the whiteboard and we started drawing. And the tool that we ended up creating is something I've used with a lot of customers. And so I'd like to walk, it, walk you through it. And actually, see that circle there? That's Earth. And that one up there is Mars. <laughs> Configured, private. This, this is not going to work. So here's the PowerPoint version. I will tell you, I, I put configured. The, the vice president was a Brit. The word he used was bespoke, which kind of has the whiff of the Queen's data center. Very high quality, surely. Perhaps a bit expensive. And, and he had goals. Here was his goal. 30%, 30%, 40%. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But the reason that this struck me so much, and the reason I'm sharing it with you, is that this image he had was so perfectly aligned with how we've structured not only this conference, but also our development, how we think about our investment. You've seen this before. Over on the left, he was saying, I want to buy storage systems. I want to build stuff out of them, but I would like to modernize them. Things like Flash, NVMe, how do we make it faster, what kind of connection, storage class, everything that uh, Octavian talked about yesterday. And in the middle, build a next generation data center. He called it private cloud, but, but next generation. It's exactly the HCI model, the solid fire model. And then finally, the, the public cloud. And so it, it just, I felt really good about it. It's like, oh my goodness, what we're building seems to be what at least this one customer actually wanted. And Joel started by saying, many of you will not just be in one of these zones, but, but two, or, or for a lot of you, even all three. And I, and I think that's right. So let me just at a very high level talk about how we think about the cloud investment. This is my favorite use case ever because it allows me to say the words interplanetary internet. There's Earth, there's Mars, there's the rover, the satellite. Data comes back. If you can't tell, that's, that's Pasadena, California. And the data, as it happens, lands on NetApp gear, which is cool, all you know, five gigabytes or whatever of it, teeny amount. And last year, as Joe mentioned, we, we showed what they were working on, which was how do we get the data into the cloud? At that point, they were experimenting with um, Cloud Sync using NFS. Now they're actually experimenting with storage grid, replicating it with objects. The next step, though, is more interesting. In addition to just getting the data into the cloud for their own compute use, they want to share the data. So how do you get the data out to other people? The actual, what's going on is, if you look at the rover, each of the sensors on the rover is designed by a particular team, and that team knows better than anybody else how to interpret that data. So they want to get the data to the team that made this sensor and to the team that made that sensor, and not just get them the data. They want to be able to have compute available for them, and they don't want to build it themselves. So do it through the cloud. So here's what's important. In this case, the cloud's not replacing the on-prem data. In fact, I think the government mandates them to keep it on-prem. It enhances it, lets them share it, gives them additional compute capabilities for it. This is not a cloud or on-prem story. It's about both. Here's, a, here's another use case. For a lot of people, data in the cloud is great. Fine with the data in the cloud. That's a good place for it. I don't need it anywhere else. For some people, that's scary. It could be for regulatory reasons. Uh, it, it could be competitive issues. You're scared, whatever. You know, your boss doesn't let you put data in the cloud. So an alternative is to put data right next to the cloud, often in an Equinix co-location center. And what's interesting, often the initial driver for this is that feeling of, do I want data in the cloud? Am I willing to let it go there? But once you get this model, it creates a very interesting opportunity, which is that exact same pool of data can be visible to this cloud and also may be visible to another cloud. Suddenly, you've got the ability not to be engaging with just one cloud, but, but multiple. So let me go back to this picture. You know for sure. I mean, if you're paying a bill to, to Amazon or Azure or Google or IBM Cloud, I mean, you, you know you're in, the, you're in the cloud. These two on the left are the line between them is a little bit softer. In fact, if you go back 10 years, 
If you were simply running some hardware with VMware on it, that would probably have qualified it. Oh, yes, that's very next generation, right? So the bar keeps rising of, of what does it feel like for next gen. One way to look at it is to think about the applications. It's very common with next generation private clouds to use apps that are designed for massive scale out. So I, I need a little bit of performance, I'll use 10 CPUs, or I need more, I'll use 100, a lot more, I'll use 1,000. Tools like MongoDB, Couchbase, Hadoop, right, fit that model. But when we look at our own private clouds that, that we build with customers with SolidFire, a lot of the apps, it, it could be SQL Server, it could be Oracle, it could be Exchange. And in, in fact, I think the app is the wrong way to think about it often. So let me make an analogy. Suppose that you were trying to help someone decide, should I buy a smartphone or should I buy a laptop? You could ask them, well, do you want to send email? But you can send email with a phone. You can send email with a laptop. Or do you want to send text messages? You can send email with a laptop, email with a, the text messages with a phone, or edit a document, create a spreadsheet. Those are the wrong questions. Here's the question you should ask. How would you like it to feel while you're doing this? Do you want to be standing on a subway with your arm around the pole doing your text message? It's like, I recommend a smartphone. Or would you like to sit down for three hours and plow through all the emails you have because you were at a conference? And it's going to be a lot of email, right? And then I rep recommend a laptop. So it's that feeling. And so what I'd like to do is show a diagram that helps you get the feeling of next generation data centers. Here's a cluster, solid fire cluster. Four nodes, that's the minimum cluster size. They're all 100% full, which Jeff Baxter taught us yesterday. That's bad, right? So let's say we want to add one more node. How does that feel? We put one more in. We extend the cluster. It thinks for a little while, and then the data just drifts. Just so you know, that's like two hours of PowerPoint right there. Gone so fast. Let's do that again. <laughs> I, if this founder thing doesn't work out. So, you know, it was four and now it's five, so it goes to 80%. And you might feel this is a really important data center. It's growing like gangbusters. I want to put in three more. Same thing again, extend it, grow it. I'm not going to do this one twice. So it was four and they were full and now it's eight, so they're all half full. So it, you just, the whole point of this style of infrastructural management is you don't get into all of the details. You don't worry about which block is where. You just add more systems and let the magic happen. Um, we've also had people, they thought it was going to grow like crazy. They expanded it to half full, didn't grow as fast as they thought. I don't have an animation for this, but you could take three of them out. I mean, first tell it drains back, those three are empty now, and you can ship it somewhere else. We call it FedEx load balancing. <laughs> and, and if you're a service provider, that's how you think about this stuff, right? Just fungible, it's not bespoke, you didn't design it and carefully watch every one, two wires to the ethernet at the top of the rack, right? Very simple, very flexible model. HCI, just add compute. How hard could it be? I do want to comment about our philosophy of HCI, because I think this is important, and you saw it yesterday. Our view is, if you look at the compute part, VMware has done an awesome job of solving the compute flows, and you, can, you don't have to worry that much about it. You can add servers in. You can pull servers out. VMware will move it around. We think they've done a great job. And so we haven't tried to replace that. We haven't tried to fight with them. We're partnering on what they're doing well at. The piece we think has not been done well is the data part. We think that's where we can add value for an exceptionally scalable model, right? So that a very different philosophy, I think, from some of our competitors who are really, really trying to displace VMware. Like, problem solved, don't worry. OK, back to, back to this picture. Remember. Um, I got distracted, but there was a conversation, me and the VP of infrastructure, the big insurance company. So we're having this conversation, 
And I'm trying to figure out, like, why 30, 30, 40? What was he thinking about? Where did these goals come from? And is it, like, capital? Can't be capital, because the cloud is OpEx. Or is it total number of people or counting apps? Or, like, and he, the answers didn't feel that good. It, he hadn't fully thought it through. And finally, I asked him, how far along are you now? And he said, oh, now. Well, right now, uh, it's 100, zero, zero. Anybody else there? <laughs> That's right, we are where we are. It's that, so, so then I said, well, what's wrong with the place you're at? And he said, what's wrong with the place I'm at is I think that 100% of my infrastructure is being done the least flexible and most expensive way. And I don't know the details, but it just seems to me I need to be pushing this other direction. And I was like, oh, so it's a third, a third, a third. But don't be thinking that right third is the smaller one. It's like the bigger one. And he's like, yeah, I made up the numbers. It was, um, but you know, again, to get started, you, you, have to, you have to push. So at that point, I really understood his mental model. It's an infrastructural model. He's got a bunch of client, server, Windows, Unix, fiber channel, Ethernet infrastructure. He wants to be able to get it into the private cloud, get it into the public cloud. Typically, it's a one-way journey out of, the, out of the configured model, but maybe back and forth between those two. A lot of people are looking at flexibility. So OK, like we're having a good conversation. You could use Cloud ONTAP. You could use um, Storage Grid. I, I'm sorry, uh, Solid Fire and, and maybe ONTAP. So like, like we're talking about how to solve his problems. And then one of the guys in the room said, boss, should I tell him about the shadow IT survey? Anybody done a shadow IT survey? Here's what they found. 40,000 cores of AWS. And that, it was a big insurance company. That rounded off to 0%. The, the story is this. They had um, the actuarial problem. They had a team of folks that, that were trying to solve a problem. Nobody had been able to solve it on-prem. And they went in and started digging. And they figured out how to throw a bunch of CPUs and Amazon at it. And they did this. And they were heroes. And they did it again, and they were heroes, and they did it again, and they were heroes. By the end of the year, they were a big budgetary problem. And so what the, what the VP told me is, I would like to bring that back. And here's the conversation we had. He didn't know the details of how they did their work, but if they did it using the platform as a service capabilities of Amazon, you, that app doesn't necessarily come right back. They were using a very specific programming environment and so just because you can move the data doesn't mean you can bring the app back. So you always have to be thinking about that. Here's the lesson. Where you can go next depends on where you are. So we're starting to get a picture here that has some texture to it that's a little bit richer than just, oh, I have infrastructure, right? What, what kind of data center is it? What style of infrastructure is it? And, and that's led to some interesting conversations. I had a whole new customer. This was the CIO of a large New York bank. And he was way further along on this journey. What he told me was, I'm, I'm big into DevOps. I think that probably for the competitiveness of my bank, one of the most important things is, can I keep these teams happy and productive? And those are closely related with programming teams. If they're happy, they're probably productive. So we talked about culture of DevOps and just culture. I mean, I've never been a DevOps programmer, but I've been a programmer, like how much pizza, uh, what, whatever the answer is. So that was number one goal. Number two goal, he said, anything they develop, I want to be able to run it in my private cloud or in the public cloud. In fact, multiple of the public clouds. And that's, that's not crazy. There's, there's a layer of infrastructure. Some people call it IaaS Plus. Um, and it's, it's tools like Kubernetes or OpenStack with applications like MongoDB or, or Cassandra or Hadoop, the sort of, with Gartner, they would call the lower layer Platform 2 and the, the next layer up Platform 3. You, you can get the open source. You can run these tools across multiple clouds. So it's certainly not a crazy goal. But what I told him is, I think that your goal number one, happy and productive DevOps, conflicts with goal number two, which is that you want to be able to run anything anywhere. And here's why. Those platform as a service, the PaaS platforms, are some of the most innovative, most productive programming environments there are. 
and you just told your teams you don't want them to use them. That will not make them happy, and that will not make them productive. And of course, the reason that he felt that way was he wanted to avoid cloud lock-in, which that makes sense. But here's the analogy I made. Think about software as a service. So let's put the next layer in. So let's say that's Salesforce. You want to use Salesforce, Guess to, best tool for you. You know what? They won't give you the code. You're stuck. You can't bring it into your private cloud. You can't bring it into your configured environment. And yet, people regularly make that choice anyway, for good reasons, right? Because for that problem, that's the best solution. And so that's what I would say is, don't be afraid of cloud lock-in. Accept it if it adds value. And the kind of value that it might add, Watson, really cool artificial intelligence. Well, that's going to be an IBM's cloud. Or Amazon's Lambda for serverless compute, super fast development and just getting things running, prototyping, that's an Amazon, right? So I'm not saying use it everywhere, but I do think it makes sense to consider it. Here's an analogy. Um, remember the old POSIX? Anybody old enough to remember POSIX? Yeah, like three hands, okay. That, but it's just because you didn't raise them. Um, here's how POSIX played out. All of the customers said, we only want to use the POSIX standard so that we can go anywhere, right? But all of the vendors were saying, our goal is to develop cool new tools so cool that your programmers want to use them anyway, right? And it was this battle between the customers wanted to stick to the small POSIX pool, the vendors were trying to create more and more cool features, the POSIX committee was trying to expand POSIX to include the cool stuff. That progression, virtuous cycle, drove an amazing amount of creativity and new capabilities. And that's exactly what's going on in the cloud. And that's the reason you should use the cloud, again, where it adds value. So I have a question. Is anybody tired of PowerPoint? I'm going to go on strike. Sometimes I just wish there was such a thing as whiteboard as a service. Can you imagine? I told you I've been drawing this picture all the time. Any whiteboard at NetApp, just go up, there's the picture. Up until now, I've been talking a lot about motion within a layer. You know, we can help you move data from this layer to this, or, or you could have data motion within this layer. Our object storage could do that. What I'd like to talk now is about data that cuts across layers. And let me use the example of JPL. Remember, their goal was to get data from a traditional on-prem data center into an environment where they could apply Amazon Analytics to it. Right? Now we're cutting across styles of data center and also cutting across layers. Or think about what we demonstrated with, with Microsoft. You've got data in your traditional environment NFS. You get it into infrastructure in Microsoft and then cut it into the Microsoft Analytics, right? We're starting to get lines that are cutting across layers, cutting across data centers. Here's an interesting one to me. One of the tools we have, we talked a little bit about uh, cloud control. You can go into your 365 data and pull it out. They do, 365 does backups for business continuance, but they're not doing backups for individual mailboxes like, oh, this person's about to leave. We should capture their mail before they go or, or whatever, and we can do that to any S3 interface. So it could, in fact, be from 365 into Amazon objects, or it could be down into a storage grid. You've got on-prem. I would consider that to be IaaS plus, the object storage layer. Or maybe you've got a bunch of customer data in some customer data cloud service, and you'd like to get it into Watson. Who should I call next? Here's what this is. Three years ago, we told you data fabric. Blah, blah, blah. What does it mean? How do we describe it? 
I can't think of a better way to describe data fabric than this picture. All of the different ways that people build data centers, all of the different styles of compute in today's world, and what we're doing is connecting them all up with data fabric lines. In fact, one of my favorite is the demo that we did yesterday, which was on-prem objects, so that's living here, linked into, Joe didn't say what the, or uh, sorry, it was, it was Adam, didn't say how it was triggered, but it was linked into the Amazon SNS, Simple Notification Service. When you add a new item to this bucket, it triggers up to Amazon. Amazon Lambda comes back down, looks at the data, updates the metadata in place. Is that cloud or is it on-prem? You can't even tell it's so tightly integrated. It's data fabric. I just love what it is we're building. We're not done, but we are clearly setting the, the stage for something cool. This, this picture, it's not telling you what you should do. It's more like a roadmap of places you could go. I had one customer say, he said, uh, you're missing something. He said, I, I had a big Hadoop problem. Actually, it started small, an experiment. Hadoop started in the cloud. Then I brought it on-prem to a, a private cloud. But the Hadoop jobs got so big, it was really chewing down our private cloud. And I realized I could build a bare metal Hadoop solution that would solve this better. He said, I, I think, isn't that a configured solution? So you can go here. It's, I, I didn't draw it that way because that's not the usual direction. But here's my point. I really think you need to be figuring out where are you trying to get. In fact, I have a piece of advice for anybody planning their future. To plan your future, start with the cloud and work backwards. And I don't mean that you have to go into the cloud. In fact, you may conclude that that's not the solution for you for this problem. But I think you should always be asking, if I was going to do it a cloudy way, how would I do it? Two reasons. Number one, there's a lot of really good thinking going on there. And, and if you don't take into account that thinking, I don't think you're going to do as good of a design. And two, even if you're not ready for the cloud right now, it's likely that you'll be considering it in the future. And if you don't take it into account in your design, you may be stuck in the wrong place. That's lesson one. Lesson two, cloud is a journey. It's not a particular endpoint, And it'll evolve over time. And to illustrate this, I'd like to tell you the story of one of our customers, Technology One in Australia. They started as a traditional software vendor. So they make software in their own on-prem environment. They send it to you you know, with a, a CD-ROM or probably over the internet. You run it yourself. And they said, we want to become a cloud vendor. So they started 100% on-prem, and they moved into 100%. They chose Amazon to start with. They used Amazon data. They used the Amazon compute. And before long, they said, we missed the NetApp features we had. And so they started using ONTAP Cloud. And eventually, they ran into an interesting situation, which is the Australian government says, no one is allowed to sell a product to the Australian government if it's just one cloud. They're trying to avoid monopoly. You have to support two clouds. So at this point, Tech One moved the data near the cloud and then could use both Amazon and Azure. So think about the journey they went from 100% out of the cloud, 100% in the cloud, half in the cloud, half out of the cloud, and then half in the cloud, half out of the cloud, and straddling two clouds. And every step of the way, NetApp was a partner with them, helping them do what they needed to do. Which leads to my final thought. NetApp is the data authority. We make this claim, and it sounds grandiose, and I know we have more to do, and we're not doing it with all of our customers yet, but we are learning, and we are helping our customers understand and embrace this new world. And I would love to do this with more of you. Let's change the world with data. Thank you very much.